So today we're going to talk about it's a dog's life. And uh, just starting off with this particular quote, which my Kapoyara teacher actually mentioned to me. No one knows so much that they have nothing to learn, and no one knows so little that they have nothing to teach, including our dogs. So today, we're going to explore the lives of four different dogs and find out what they can do to teach us how to live our lives better. Dog number one, we are looking at Saffron. Saffron is a beautiful, beautiful two-year-old German Shepherd. She has got a very interesting habit. I am very, very sure that your dogs have got interesting habits as well. Can you think of an interesting habit that your dog has? For Saffron, her interesting habit was he loves jumping up for his Kong that is filled with treats. So much more that his guardian would hang them up high in the garden for him to reach and jump up every day. When he gets it, he will lift it a little bit higher. And gets it higher again until he reach a height that he can no longer reach. At this moment in time, it seemed to be impossible. And that is where his guardian would drop the Kong lower and let him to have it. One day, he went out to the garden as usual and found that Kong at an impossible height, a so-called impossible height. He looked at it, adjusted the feet a little bit. The wind was breezy, not unlike today, with little leaves flying in hurricanes behind there. And he jumped. Maybe it was the wind. Maybe he had a very good rest the night before. Maybe the branch swayed a little bit lower down and he managed to get the Kong regardless. He came down and had the Kong in his mouth. His guardian couldn't believe his eyes. Have you ever achieved something in your life that you felt was impossible to start off with? Have you ever had dreams that you had pushed aside, given up, because you felt that it was too far to reach? How do people achieve what is deemed impossible? How do you gauge your own limits? We are shaped by beliefs. Our beliefs from the environment is what builds us up. A belief is nothing more than a sense of certainty. You were not born with beliefs. They were incorporated into you either consciously or subconsciously through the surroundings, your influences, the people you meet. When you get a belief like, how far can you go in this world? That is what brings you further. Sometimes when we think about our references, our references are events, experiences, whether they are real or not, to allow us to see how far we can actually push things. For example, if you had baked a wonderful, delicious, luscious chocolate cake before they had won awards, that would have provided you a reference to say that maybe I am a good baker compared to someone who has not seen an oven before. However, if the someone who has not seen an oven before actually have you as a friend, they will also provide a reference to say that, hey, if he can do it, so can I. And don't forget that references may not be real either. Like the, for the Wright brothers, when they were building their aeroplanes, they did not have a real life reference to see a machine that allowed men to fly. Their reference purely was a fiction of their imagination. It was, came all from the imagination. So why is this important in achieving goals, especially seemingly impossible goals? Whether you achieve your goal or not really depends on the extent, what sort of beliefs you have and the extent of the references that you have. If you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're both right. When we are doing things, when we are sort of seeing things that is um, seemingly impossible, what sort of feelings do we get? Have you ever tried to dissuade someone of an idea that you know is not possible, but they believe that it is very, very possible? What about persuading someone to do something that you know is very, very possible, however, they do not think so? It is very, very hard. So what about you? How do your beliefs and your references shape up? 
do do they allow you to do what is needed? Do they allow you to do what is needed? Are they limiting your growth as a person or are they allowing you to do what you need to do to achieve the impossible? When you're committed enough to do to sit down and write down your goals, do you actually have the belief that what the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve? Are your beliefs limiting or limitless? Are your references vast enough for you to see what is happening? So what's an example of a limiting belief? A limiting belief would be like, um, I do not know how to do this. At my age, I should know how to do this. Maybe it's not meant to be. Or this is uh, not the norm. People have tried and they have failed. Maybe I shouldn't do this. I should try to play it safe. Remember that, do you remember that when you were a child and your mind was free, nothing was impossible. You had a whole life full of make-believe and your beliefs were just, there were no limits to them. What about references? Do you live in an environment whereby your references are vast? And remember, references is nothing more than an experience that allow you to think whether something is real or not. Imagine a baby that if she, a baby can only walk because she saw an adult walking before. Imagine a completely healthy baby that had not seen anybody walk before. And over time, she may not even walk in the end because there simply wasn't a reference for it. So remember that references are not real as well. And sometimes it is not easy to have references in our lives that, that can provide wide references. So that is where we look at other people's lives. And that's also where we look at books. So leaders are readers. When you are reading a book, it's almost like having a conversation with the author. You have to let your mind spread, let your imagination run wild. And Einstein has said before, imagination is so much, so much more important than knowledge. Remember when you were a child, where your life was just full of make-beliefs. What happened to that? So when your beliefs are limitless and your references are vast, you'll find that you can almost achieve anything you want in your life. And that is what is holding you back. So when you read the word impossible as I am possible, or see the imp in impossible for merely what he is, just an imp, you'll find that your beliefs will carry you through. Your references are vast. It shows what is possible. It will show you that things are actually not as impossible as it is as well. And nothing can stop you. So if you're not achieving your goals, what is holding you back? What reasons or excuses are holding you back? Or is it simply that your beliefs are a little bit more limiting? So Saffron, filled with positive expectancy and active faith, has jumped up got what he wanted? What about you? Remember, if you change your thinking, you change your behavior, you will change your life. And with this, we are going... So Chip Soba once said, our mental models are not so much views and beliefs that we hold tightly as they are views and beliefs that tightly hold us. Have a little think about that. Remember when your dog had the interesting habits achieving the impossible, how does our lives, our beliefs compare to that? Now we're going to talk about one of my little favorite topics, puppies. We all love puppies. So we're going to explore the life of little Fred, who is a three-month-old Labrador who knows exactly what he wants. He likes tugging his guardian's trousers when he wants to play. Can you relate? Do your dog tuck your trousers. I want to play right about now. So one day he was doing that. He was whining. He was whimpering. He wanted to go for a walk. He wanted to play. But his garden was busy typing on her laptop because she had an assignment to do. And he didn't give up. Just kept whining and whimpering until, until, one, until the garden was looking at him and said, seriously? Went to the kitchen, took his favorite treat, gave it to him. He ignored it. And after that, she took his favorite toy and gave it to him. He ignored that as well. Can you imagine a puppy ignoring a treat and a toy and still tugging and whimpering? And she was still tapping on the laptop 
Finally, he did the unexpected. He started howling. Howling in melancholy. It sounded as though someone has died. His guardian turned around, looked at him, and just went, seriously? She couldn't work anymore in this racket. So in the end, she relented, gave up, and took him out to play. So little Fred knew exactly what he wanted. He ignored his food bribes, toy bribes, to get what he wanted. And he actually got what he wanted in the end. So how badly do you want something in life? When life has got an interesting way of checking our resolve and seeing how bad we actually want things. So when you say you want something in life, how badly do you want it? Have you ever given up on something that you meant to do very well? For example, you were plugging it in, you were making good progress, you were actually enjoying the process and getting good results, then suddenly you just stopped. Let's take jewelry making, for example. You bought the kit, you spent money, invested time in the course, and after that, you were doing well, you were doing better than well, it was more than the basics. You were inspired, you even thought that maybe I could make a living out of this. It just went on. Then suddenly you stopped. Or maybe it's something that you wanted to do, like travel the world or to write a book. You saw people who have done it, spoken to them, relieved their experience. And you're pumped up, you're fired up, you're determined to make it yours. You even made a plan with different stages. And after that, you had, um, you even maybe even completed some of the stages. Then suddenly you stop. So what happened? There is always some reasons or excuses that hinder you, that stop your momentum, that stop you from making progress. Life got busy. Attention got spent elsewhere. It was something that you didn't expect. Lack of resources, which usually meant lack of resourcefulness, and the challenges were mounting. There was more pain than pleasure. What turned out to be fun initially was now no longer fun. Something always happens to prevent you from getting what you want. And you think to yourself, maybe someday when I have more time, or someday when I have more money, or someday when the children are old enough and they have left the house, maybe you think something along the lines of uh, when such and such happens, things will be much easier. Or this is my favorite. When the feeling comes back, I'll do it. You know what I mean, the list goes on, it goes on and on. It is either somebody else's fault, or some life's event's fault, or actually you found out you didn't want it that badly anyway. So what does this mean? Life is really constantly testing your level of commitment. Every day, people, events, your life will challenge you to see how badly you want something. If you observe people who have succeeded in any field, whether it's business, sports, uh, relationships, their family, you'll find that they achieve all of that, not because they had a special talent, which sometimes talent can play a small part in, or they had it easy, because they certainly didn't. They achieve all that despite of what life threw everything at them, because they were committed. They had to succeed. They simply had to succeed. They didn't take no, no, sorry, they couldn't take no for an answer. When their plan failed, they made a new plan, they pivoted, and went for it again. Their goals were rigid, but their approach was flexible. They didn't give up, they didn't say no, they didn't give in. When it hit a wall, they would climb over it, climb around it, dig under it, or sometimes even bash right through it. They simply couldn't take no for an answer, and because they did that, they simply had to succeed. They could, didn't give up, they didn't give in. So if you fail to succeed, to get what you want in life, maybe it's because you didn't really want badly. That after all, imagine if you're underwater struggling to breathe, and the only way to get breath is swim to the top. No matter what happened, no matter how tired you are, you will focus every single ounce of your energy and body to get to the top. And also you will be your focus will be clear, direct, and pristine to make sure you summon every single bit of your mind and soul to swim for that bit of air. Imagine using that sort of commitment, that level of commitment to do what you want to do and to achieve what you want to achieve. Do you still, do you still think 
that you will not succeed at all. So be clear of what you want and commit yourself to it. You come with an unknown expiry date and the potential in you is immense. Fred knew exactly what I wanted. What are you waiting for? Right now, I'm going to transport you to another place in Oakhampton, in Belston. So it was an annual fete in Belston, in Oakhampton. It was, so you can smell the popcorn. You could also smell the hot rolls in the air. The much awaited dog race was the most anticipated event, anticipated event of the day. There were five spring spaniels. There were two spotty Dalmatians. There were seven tricolored Jack Russell's just yapping the head off, and there were 25 other breeds of dogs of all shapes and sizes. The stage was set. The race was 80 meters across the grass. And the referee blew the foghorn, and the hounds were released. At 10 meters, all the dogs were more or less equal. At 30 meters, the toy dog breeds were all left behind, and a beautiful spotted Dalmatian was running with four spring spaniels hot at her heels. At 50 meters, suddenly out of the blue, we had a black flash. We had a black flash that just ran out. And just before you know it, it, it finished the race before any other dog actually went past the 60 meters. This black flash was a two-year-old Saluki. He had a supple spine, aerodynamic shape, long legs. Those were his unfair advantage. There was simply no way that the other dogs could have caught up with him. He owned the game. So what is your unfair advantage? Have you developed your unfair advantage to help you succeed in life? When we are born, we have... The only thing that all of us have in common is that we are unique. Your DNA, your influence, your experience, is all unique to you. No one else has that. When we were born, imagine how does that happen? You're a chance, you're, you're a sort of product of evolution, of many, many years of chance and events. Your ancestors were one of the few that actually survived the wars, the natural calamities, and any sort of disasters that there, is, that there is, out of the billion, billion sperm, one, met out of the many, many eggs, or many, many cycles, to form a fertilized embryo that, despite all odds, developed into a fetus that resulted in you. Do you understand what a miracle you are? In the chance of, in the, in the midst, in the event of all this complexity and chances, a unique you is formed. Do you still have any doubt? that you are as special as you can be, and there's no one else in the world like you. So somehow, by extension, somehow, somehow, you must have some form of unfair advantage that no one else has in the whole world. Some people, they have compassionate souls. Some people, they have photographic memory. Others, they may have a, a, ten, a huge attention to detail in their dealings. And maybe some others have got a flair of language. What is yours? Have you actually found it and developed it to allow you to rock in your daily undertakings, in your relationship, in your life, in your work? Because you are unique. For example, Michael Phelps. He was double jointed, so he was much more flexible. He had a much larger, a larger lung capacity, 12 liters compared to the normal six. His torso was much longer than his legs, making it perfect for swimming. And he had size 14 feet that were like flippers. Those were his unfair advantages, even before we threw in the skills, the technique, the determination, the coaching involved. Michael Jordan, his unfair advantage is, is his unrelentless drive to succeed. He wasn't necessarily the tallest basketball player, nor was he the fastest basketball player, but no one else had more drive to succeed than he did. He was often quoted to be playing at a different level. If he is competing at a different level, there was simply no competition. So know that you are special, you are unique, and you do have at least one, if not more, unique advantages. Be sure to use that to allow you to rock your world, 
smash your world with brilliance and success. And when you do so, you bring everyone else around you up with you. You are special, you are beautiful, and you know it. Don't forget that. With this, we're going to go to our last animal, our last little doggy, which I would argue to be the most important dog, most important lesson of this. We're going to discuss the importance of play. That's little Sprite there. So Sprite is a seven-month-old Bellington Terrier Whippet Cross. And he was walking with his owners. The air was crisp. You could taste the spring in the air. And his tail was wagging like nobody's business, like there was no tomorrow. And after that, what happened was that he was just looking at the owner. The message was very, very clear. It spoke only of one word, play. How often do you play in your life? What would your life look like if you had more play in it? Remember that when you were a child, the whole world around you was a perpetual playground. The ground, the floor could be lava. The chairs could be islands. The pillows on the floor could be stepping stones so your feet didn't get wet. And a simple stick could become a lightsaber. It was easy. You saw the world through with wonder through your bright and inquisitive eyes. Life was fun. Even though when you had nothing, a box could become a car or a cart or a tank or even a time machine. It was simply simple. You relied on your imagination more than your knowledge to navigate your journey through life. Somehow along the way, we got older. You got serious. Through the shaping of the environment, perhaps from your parents, from your teachers, from society, it was normal and right. You were told to grow up and stop acting like a child. You even almost convinced yourself that games are for kids. That is a mistake. Life is like a game, supposed to be played with great enthusiasm, especially, especially if you desire to win. What will your life look like? It's so easy to forget how to play. You first had knowledge put into you in school, in uh, sort of uh, in facts and syllabus, and you take exams in school. It's so easy to forget that the word education comes from a Latin word, educare, which means to draw out, not to cram in. The purpose, the aim of education should be to draw out the genius, the potential of each child, rather than to, cl uh, rather than to cl uh, cram information in. The easiest way to draw out the potential of a child is simply through play. What would your life look like if you had more play in it? What, how would you view your work if you included play in it? How would you feel? Imagine if you imagine your work to be like a craft, a game that you want to excel in. When you are so-called working, would you feel different if you saw it as a game? Would it, would it allow you to achieve more without draining you? At the end of the day, when you feel tired from playing rather than from working, how would that feel? Find a job that you love and you never have to work a day in your life. What about your relationships? Feel your relationships with spontaneity, festivity, laughter, and maybe even wild abandonment. When was the last time you played with your partner? How often do you do that? Remember, when you were a child, you used to play daily, every day, without a doubt. You would get up, you find someone or something to play with. As we got older, life got more serious. It was more normal and right to stop playing and actually be a grown-up. We actually forgot how to play. It is when we became adults that we took on the responsibilities of life and it became much more difficult to remember that we should be playing instead. So, children are our teachers. Your dogs are your teachers. Adults are nothing more than deteriorated children. We knew exactly what we wanted to do before until we sort of grew up and actually forgot how to live. Imagine if you're enjoying yourself. Imagine if you can live your life like a child and you connect to others like a child. If you're enjoying yourself, you laugh. There is no decorum. There is no perceived notions. There was no imagined ideas. And if you didn't like someone, you say it. 
There was no hypocrisy. There was no false associations. There was no devious schemes. What would your life look like if you could express yourself clearly and plainly? A lot of repressed emotions, they tend to come out eventually, biting you in the backside when you least expect it. How often do you repress your emotions? Does it have to be like this? Why not bring more play into your life? Find time to be reckless and silly. Bring courage, bring courage and adventure to your workplace. Bring curiosity back into your life. Get back to the sense of wonder and awe in your connection with your life and experiences. Remember the time when your life was full of make-believe and how you enjoy every single moment in this particular journey that we call living. When you're feeling despair, when you're feeling stressed, just turn to your kids and turn to your pets. Observe how they live their lives with our huge brain and our tiny hearts. There are still lessons on play that we might still learn. So in future, when you next get dressed for work, when you're going to meet your partner, when someone asks you, what are you going to do or what are you doing? I challenge you to say with gusto the only word that matters, play. Sprite understands the importance of play. Do you? Remember, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. So I've shared with you four different dogs. You have to remember that. To summarize it, reach up for the sky. Remember Saffron, the white German Shepherd, reaching to impossible heights. Extend your beliefs. Make your references vast. Reach for the sky. Don't forget about Fred, the little puppy who always wants something and do whatever he needs to do to get it. Never, ever give up. Never, ever give up. And don't forget to develop your best self. Explore, find your unfair advantage. Utilize that because you are special, you are unique, and you are beautiful. Last but not least, don't forget to play. Enjoy life. We are all here for a little while only. So let's not take life too seriously. Humor should be taken more seriously instead. And with this, I hope you have gotten something from there. I wish you a very, very pleasant day and have a great time at Wolfstock. Thank you very much.